what's happening, folks. I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. So remember how after the global financial crisis, we were supposed to reform an out-of-control banking system that thrived on lining the pockets of the 1% at the expense of the rest of us? Well, apparently the world's billionaires didn't get the memo. See, according to a report just released by Oxfam International, since the crisis, quote, ended in 2009, the number of billionaires has actually doubled. That's right. In 2009, there were 793 billionaires worldwide. As of March of this year, that number now stands at 1,645. So wealth inequality must be decreasing if so many more people are entering the rarefied space occupied by the Cokes and Soroses of the world. Mm, not so much. See, the report also found that billionaire wealth has only become more concentrated, increasing by a combined 120% over that same time period. And you know, the timing of the report is quite interesting because just days earlier, UNICEF found that child poverty has increased in over 20 developed countries since the global recession. But I'm sure there's no connection between the two. Now let's break the set. Speculation has been replacing hard fact. The terrorists don't read Twitter. Who's right and who's wrong? It was a terrible thing to say, period. The mistake entirely on me. What we need is to question more and to keep it uncensored, real and raw. These words are hard hitting, you're watching your neck, but you need to tune in because we're going to get set. When it comes to the corporate media's coverage of stories south of the border, it seems like every news piece is reduced to a superficial debate over the immigration crisis. But what's almost never discussed is the rampant corruption that has infected local governments across Mexico, leading to the brutal suppression and use of mass violence against civilian populations. Over the course of the last few months, we've seen every part of the stark reality played out in the southern Mexican city of Iguala. See, back in September, 43 students from a teacher's college went missing after they were viciously attacked by local police during a protest against discriminatory hiring practices, leaving six people dead. In the days and weeks following, at least 12 mass burial graves were discovered near the city, filled with the charred and dismembered remains of dozens of bodies, leading Iguala residents to fear the worst about the fate of these young students. However, according to Mexican officials, the DNA of these particular bodies did not match the students, highlighting just how prevalent mass murder really is in this part of the country. And just this week, yet another mass grave was uncovered about 10 miles from where the students were last seen, reigniting a nightmare scenario all over again. But as disturbing as these findings are, an even more insidious fact lurks beneath the surface of the investigation that virtually the entire government of Iguala was directly responsible for the disappearance of these students. See, based on interviews with dozens of witnesses, investigators allege that after the students were attacked by the cops, they were handed over to members of one of Mexico's deadliest drug cartels, Los Guerros Unidos. And this is hardly a case of just a few rogue compromised officers. In fact, all the evidence points directly to the former mayor of Iguala, Jose Abarca, and his wife, Maria Pineda, as being the masterminds behind this sick plot. Members of Guerros Unidos have now admitted that at least 30 Iguala police officers were working directly for the cartel under the leadership of Abarca and Pineda, and that they've acted as the couple's personal hitmen. And while 56 people have been arrested in connection to this potential mass murder, Abarca and Pineda have been missing for weeks and are now considered fugitives. Now, the motive for such a despicable act is still not entirely clear, but the most logical explanation is that the student protests disrupted a campaign event that Pineda was holding on the same day to launch her own bid for mayor. Of course, throughout the course of these events, federal authorities have distanced themselves as far as possible from the Iguala government, all along feigning shock at what transpired there. But average Mexicans know better than to trust those in Mexico City have no idea what was going on in a town just 100 miles away. According to a senator from the Barca's own political party, quote, everyone knew about their presumed connections to organized crime. Nobody did anything. Not the federal government, not the state government, not the party leadership. 
See, these disappearances are just the latest to hit Mexico during the war on drugs. In fact, according to the Mexican government's own figures, over the course of the last eight years, a stunning 20,000 people have gone missing. This, on top of the 60,000 people that have been killed in connection to the drug war just between the years 2006 and 2012. All the while, billions of dollars continue to be funneled into Mexico from the U.S. as part of the Merida Initiative. In theory, this money is supposed to be used to eliminate the most violent criminal gangs on Earth. But instead, there's almost no oversight of where money and arms end up, or whether this foreign aid is funding and supplying the very entities that are supposed to be dismantled. Not to mention the DEA's explicit protection of the Sinaloa cartel, the biggest drug cartel in the world, in exchange for information about rival cartels, according to an investigation by Mexican newspaper El Universal. However, even though this approach has been an abysmal failure, and corruption and utter disregard for human life within the Mexican government can be tracked to the highest levels, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. The disappearance of these students might just be the catalyst for real grassroots action among Mexico's youth and working class. Last week, tens of thousands of young people marched across the country in solidarity with the students. In Mexico City alone, 50,000 people filled Zocalo Square, demanding that the investigation into the student's disappearance be taken out of the hands of the federal government and transferred to a local people's committee. Hopefully, these demonstrations are just the beginning of a much larger movement that will finally serve as a warning for Mexico's political brass that this insane level of corruption, murder, and betrayal can no longer be tolerated. But hey, I guess talking about how high of a wall to build on the border is a far more important discussion. This week it came to light that the FBI recently raided the home of an unidentified government contractor in Northern Virginia, who's been coined the second Snowden. Officials suspect that he or she is the source of the August 5th leak of classified documents that expose the shocking length of the government's no-fly list. So, who is this mysterious figure, and will we see the government prosecute yet another whistleblower in the months to come? Join me now to discuss the case is RT correspondent Marina Portnaya. Amazing to have you in studio, Thanks Marina. Thanks for having me, Abby. So, I know that we don't know much, obviously, right. but what do we know about the leaker so far, if anything? And, and explain uh, the August 5th mm -hmm. release. What exactly was that leak that um, he or she released? Well, according to reports, uh, this leaker is an employee of a federal contracting firm that allegedly handed it over. He allegedly handed over sensitive documents to journalists at The Intercept about uh, the government's terror watch list. As you mentioned in your introduction, um, back in August, journalists Jeremy Scahill and Ryan Devereaux published a story showing that uh, at least half of the people listed on the U in the U.S. government's terrorist screening database had no recognized terrorist group uh, affiliation. It's important to note that 680,000 people are listed in that database. So imagine half of them, no affiliation, no terrorist affiliation. Uh, what they also disclosed is that uh, New York City, Dearborn, Michigan were among the cities that had the most people listed on the database. Dearborn, uh, Dearborn Michigan, uh, their population is 40 percent Arab. So of course, this bombshell of a story prompted a lot of questions about how the U.S. government's uh, programs are using ethnic and racial mapping to identify alleged terrorist suspects. But it also, you know, raised questions about how many innocent people, hundreds of thousands of them are being deemed uh, suspected terrorists when they have no reason to be considered suspected terrorists. It was a really, really uh, bombshell report. And I remember um, Greenwald kind of coming out and saying, yes, this does, you know, there is obviously a second leaker because Snowden's already kind of That's released right. the trove. What I want to know is I wonder, you know, if, if he or she has leaked anything else that we'll see coming up. But of course, as we just mentioned, the FBI has raided mm -hmm. allegedly the home of this leaker. Um, I wanted to kind of segue over to your Yahoo News report that a source at the Justice Department claims that the agency, quote, may now be more reluctant to bring criminal charges involving unauthorized disclosures to the news media. I, I feel like, I mean, it, he could just be blowing smoke here. I mean, yeah. <laughs> considering the trend so far, I mean, how do you think that this new leaker will impact the way that the president will, will 
basically prosecute in the future. Well, look, the president, uh, Barack Obama, and his administration are really under fire for uh, prosecuting already seven people, seven whistleblowers under the Espionage Act. Um, Snowden, Edward Snowden, is still facing espionage charges despite uh, all of the people that are calling for his clemency. So Obama's anti-leak efforts uh, and his aggressive tactics against whistleblowers has uh, faced blowback, if you will. So maybe the White House may not want to start another PR debacle for themselves, especially uh, if this current whistleblower, this leaker that we're talking about, is leaking information uh, in the public's interest, because that's something the Espionage Act does not even take into consideration, that if the information is in the public's interest, maybe that person should not be prosecuted and jailed. Right, and we're talking about a Cold War, or no, not even Cold War, World War One piece of exactly. legislation that yeah. was basically about prosecuting spies. Here we are in 2014, where it's just, you know, journalists getting swept under the rug like Assange, potentially getting charged with that. I mean, it's ridiculous. And of course, you have have, while Snowden and these people are being painted as criminals, traitors, the very article that revealed the FBI investigation of the second leaker was full of unnamed government sources who asked not to be identified. It's hilarious, especially when you see Eli Lake, Josh Rogan basically uh, <laughs> you know, being awarded for being stenographers. All they do is cite anonymous Stenog government sources. <laughs> What is the difference here of like, it's just to make them look good, I guess, is when they don't care. Well, the difference is when um, you see publications and journalists citing sources, it's usually government officials who want that story planted. <laughs> they want that story revealed and released. But they do not want whistleblowers and leakers like Edward Snowden leaking information that would benefit the public to know. So it's about them controlling the story. Sources are usually the ones controlling the story. The White House wants that leaked. But then if it's a, a whistleblower, a, a leaker that wants the public to know what's happening, um, then those are the people that are vilified. Right, and of course, uh, the DOD just released a new directive to combat the leaks, saying that leaks will now be called serious security incidents. It just seems like this is just a really big new strategy here to kind of uh, launch a new assault on, on whoever this leaker is. Uh, we have about 30 left. Okay, I think it's just semantics. That's yeah. all it is. They created a phrase that makes it feel like if, uh, if something is leaked, then it violates or it puts national security interests at risk, and that's all it is. Yep, well, <laughs> Obama's the king of rhetoric, so yeah. I guess it's par for the course here. Thanks so much, Marina Pornaya. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, some of the most censored stories of the year. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss it. You know that guy who wishes someone would spy on him? How about the woman who enjoys being lied to by her government? This citizen can't get enough congressional inaction. And this taxpayer wants the mainstream media to be more corporatized. While this person would rather eat genetically modified food, this one thinks our prisons are not crowded enough. And what do these people have in common? They don't exist. Most people think to stand out in this business, you need to be the first one on top of the story or the person with the loudest voice or the biggest ratings. In truth, to stand out in the news business, you just need to ask the right questions and demand the right answers. Question more. percent of American news is filtered through only six monolithic corporations, which means that many people are missing out on the biggest, most important stories that most affect them and the planet. Luckily, we have Project Censored, a research-based organization that embodies everything journalism should be. Among many other services, the group highlights the year's top 25 most censored stories in its annual book a book that gives an incredibly detailed analysis on power structures and the oppressive media landscapes that stifle the news we truly need. Well, earlier I was joined by the director of Project Censored, Mickey Huff, where we talked about just five of the stories covered in the book, Censored 2015, Inspiring We the People. I first asked him about a censored story concerning a historic lawsuit that challenges the nuclear power industry's immunity from nuclear liability. A lot of people don't realize Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, right? I mean, that, that's, that's um, 
that's one of the that's the major company that was responsible for a lot of the failures at Fukushima. But also Toshiba, Hitachi, and General Electric and their Mark One reactors. Um, they are prone to hydro, uh, to uh, dangerous uh, gas buildups, and we're using them, in fact, here in the United States, even. And uh, since 1972, these reactors have been considered safety risks because of hydrogen gas buildup. And there are uh, close to 1,500 plaintiffs, including 13, I'm sorry, 38 residents of Fukushima, 357 people from outside Japan. I mean, again, uh, this is a major issue trying to hold accountable the nuclear power industry. There is another suit, by the way, by U.S. Navy personnel who were on the USS Ronald Reagan that were exposed to radiation. Some of those people are sick and near death at this point. We covered that story on the Project Censored radio show, and then it was subsequently picked up, thankfully, uh, by Amy Goodman and people at Democracy Now! Um, but most people aren't paying any attention to this. And I have to say, another one of the big problems in these cases is that most people in the United States don't seem to pay a lot of attention to them unless they involve Americans. And people in Japan are really on the front line of this. Uh, you know, and again, TEPCO is dumping hundreds of tons of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean daily. Um, we're going to be covering another major Fukushima show here in a couple of weeks. And it, again, it's an ongoing nightmare. When you turn on corporate media, all you hear is Ebola, 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 Ebola. Ebola might be a, a big problem for some people in Western African countries, but it's not really a problem in the United States. The dangers we face from nuclear fallout, nuclear radiation are actually far greater, particularly in California, where we have you know major nuclear power plants on fault lines. And of course, GE, you mentioned how they're exacerbating the problem. GE, who do they own? <laughs> Major news networks here in the U.S. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to uh, the Cato Institute, uh, who cited that Americans are eight times more likely to be killed by a police officer than a terrorist. Mickey, that, might, that, that number excuse me, might be even higher because the 18th most censored story of the year is the fact that there's no federal database citing the amount of police killings per year in the U.S. America has some of the most trigger-happy cops in the country. Why do you think this doesn't exist, and what's being done to fill the void and provide that data? Well, uh, D. Brian Burghardt is an editor of re uh, uh, the Reno News Review. He's a journalism uh, instructor at the University of Nevada. He actually decided to create a public database this year because the FBI may track how many police officers die in the line of duty, but it doesn't keep record of how many civilians are killed by police each year. Now, there are important databases and there are important people. Um, one of our judges, uh, journalist Jeff Davidian, just called our attention to uh, the Missouri University Journalism Department that, that has a couple of people there paying attention more and more to these kind of statistics, specifically around mass shootings. But Burkhardt is interested in, in paying attention to, you know, just simply how many people are killed. Now, we do know, even though there's not a, a comprehensive database, that police have killed at least twice as many people as died on 9-11, right? So we have this so-called war on terror. Where is the so-called war on domestic terrorism through wanton police killings? Um, that, that's what we'd like to know. But again, a lot of people don't realize this is an issue. You know, we have an entire chapter in Censored 2015, Inspiring Me the People by Peter Phillips, Diana Grant, that looks at so-called justifiable homicides, the lack of this kind of database. And it goes back and interviews uh, victims' families. And how are these people treated by police who have members of their families killed by police? How does the media tend to cover these people's stories? And it covers them in an extraordinarily skewed way way. Let's move on to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, a highly secretive piece of legislation, trade legislation, being negotiated between 12 countries will stand to affect about 800 million people. Yet, as your book outlines, only three people from each member nation have access to the entire document. That's a stunning fact right there. What was revealed in the chapter released by WikiLeaks? Well, uh, you know, once again, we can see why there is this great effort to shoot the messenger, whether it be Julian Assange at Wiki WikiLeaks or Ed Snowden or others, uh, other whistleblowers of this type. Um, the Diplomat wrote this, Voice of Russia wrote about this, uh, and even Yes Magazine <clears throat> has picked up on some of this. Uh, a few of the things that, that really came out here um, is 
uh, that there are, uh, for example, Hollywood and the pharmaceutical industry have some sort of wish list items here uh, that were leaked uh, about TPP on intellectual property rights, on patent laws. Uh, you know, Hollywood and the pharmaceutical industry, you know, oft decry piracy um, and, and that they're losing great profits and so on. Uh, but the problem with TPP is, is Obama was actually trying to fast track this. And we've learned here in just the last day or so that Japan's not going to go on board with it and agree with it. Uh, a couple other countries have some questions with it. And the fast track looks like it's being, well, slow tracked. Uh, it's, this has been going on for over a decade, by the way. But there's very been very little coverage of TPP, even though there are over 600 groups lobbying on TPP. So the private sector and the corporate sector are allowed to influence and find out what's going on with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But as you said, only three official members from each of the 12 nation states involved in TPP um, are really able to do this. And the public knows almost nothing about it. So we have WikiLeaks to thank, of course, um, for helping us understand why they don't want to to know some of the things that are going on here. And in the U.S. press, it's really only been the Washington Post that's covered it. The New York Times, the L.A. Times, Wall Street Journal, they passed on these stories, and some of the critics of TPP have called it NAFTA on steroids. So it does stand to affect a large number of people in a major uh, global, global trade treaty. Right, and so many different facets of life that will be affected by that legislation. Let's move on to climate change, Mickey. Uh, the book's eighth censored story is the corporate media ignoring those connections between extreme weather, global warming, in which it states, a study by fairness and accuracy in reporting found that extreme weather events in 2013 resulted in 450 news segments, of which only 16, 16, mentioned climate change. I mean, for as much coverage as the weather gets, Mickey, why do you think the underlying cause is being ignored? Well, you know, corporate media has a lot of money in it from the fossil fuel industry. We know that. We also know that there has been this incredible push for false balancing in the U.S. corporate press about so-called climate change. By the way, just the term climate change literally comes from the GOP and their uh, in-house linguist, Frank Luntz, who after conducting numerous um, focus groups on the problems of global warming and the way that it sounds to people is that if they called it climate change, it tended to foment more doubt that people were actually responsible for changes in climate. And there's very little connection to extreme weather patterns to climate change. We hear every single week in weather uh, reports about how there's severe weather all over the place, crazy weather around the world. But there's very little attention paid to what's driving it, which is climate change and global warming. And uh, Fairness and Action reporting, Dar Jamal, Yes Magazine, they've all called this uh, they've called this out and we need to you know every week there's practically every week there's a new study coming out saying that scientists have actually underestimated their own projected impacts of global warming so this is something that we really are running out of time on as a as 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 the human race this isn't a, a, um, this isn't a nation state affair even though we have people talking about carbon tax and trade carbon you know taxing carbon emissions and china and india and the united states bickering about this and kyoto and so forth this is a this is a, about humanity there are actually were a couple of uh, scientists that just published a fictitious account a dystopic novel if you will projecting what the data looks like and how it's going to be impacting people in less than hundred years and Abby the picture is not pretty and part of this again then is as soon as we start to really get reporting about what's really going on with this and the serious scientific consensus among climate scientists about global warming we can disappear the the, the, the so-called scientists paid by Exxon Mobil's Heartland Institute to cast doubt as underreported as climate change is, nothing compares to the top censored story from this year's book, Mickey. Um, ocean acidification is increasing at an unprecedented rate. Interestingly enough, not only do I never hear this being talked about, but when I do, it's framed as a severe market loss, as if the oceans don't serve any other purpose than some monetary input for the human race, Mickey. Break down exactly what ocean acidification is, what its rise means for the planet, and why you chose to make this number one censored story of the year. Well, our judges really thought that this was an important issue. The last several years, we've really been hitting on a lot of these global warming, climate change, environmental degradation stories from, excuse me, from the, the BP Gulf catastrophe 
to uh, right here, ocean acidification. This was covered by Mother Jones, Science Now, even the Seattle Times. And by the way, after this book went to press, uh, Andy Lee Roth and I uh, submitted it in June, ocean acidification literally made the cover of Newsweek magazine. So the corporate media has started to pay some attention to this crucial issue, but then they had no follow-up on it. And this is really sad. Mickey Z has just recently pu published a number of stories on the significance of ocean acidification. Let me just very quickly break this down. Um, you know, coal, oil, natural gas release of carbon dioxide. Uh, th this is th some of this is absorbed by the oceans. Okay, about 20 trillion pounds, about a quarter of carbon dioxide is absorbed into oceans. And while uh, scientists have uh, been uncertain over the years about exactly what this means, they're starting to get a much clearer picture. The Arctic Ocean Acidification Assessment uh, Study um, has said that, look, we are now realizing that this is causing a lot of problems at the bottom end of the food chain. Um, another article published in Proceedings of Royal Society B has shown that this, is, this ocean acidification is dissolving shells and shellfish. It's also negatively affecting pteropods and fast dissolving shelves, uh, shells. And pteropods are on the, the bottom end of the food chain, but that affects all the other food uh, chain in the ocean, including Pacific salmon, pink salmon, which is, of course, uh, crucial to the North Pacific fisheries. And, Abby, you mentioned that, oh, uh, people only seem to care about this as if, if it, as if it's a market share problem. And at least if we take a look at that market share problem, and if this is what it takes to get people right. interested in this issue of losing a billion dollar a year Pollock fishery profits and so forth, then so be it. But this is, of course, as you you know were insinuating, this is a much bigger problem than what's going on with the seafood market. I mean, we, as John Kennedy warned 50, uh, more than 50 years ago, we know little about the ocean, but the health of the ocean and the stability of the ocean is directly connected to our survival as a species on the planet. And Abby, the news we're hearing about ocean acidification is absolutely riveting, and it is not good news. It is acidifying faster than leading scientists had ever predicted. And again, it's another one of these stories where we have this trajectory that scientists are now saying we are uh, surprised by our own lack of accurate estimates in how big of a problem this is fast becoming. Uh, Mickey, wow, unbelievable. Everyone check out the new book, Project Censored, forward by Ralph Nader. Mickey Huff, director of Project Censored, always incredible to have your insight. Really, everyone's got to go buy this book right now. Thanks, Abby. It's a fun, uh, good time breaking the set. Re your viewers can go to projectcensored.org to learn more. Thanks so much, Mickey. And thank you for watching. Be sure to follow me on the Twitter sphere at Abby Martin. Follow us on our Facebook page, Breaking the Set. Join, my, join me tomorrow when I break the set all over again. Good night. Twenty percent over that same time period. And you know, the timing of the report is quite interesting because just days earlier, UNICEF found that child poverty has increased in over 20 developed countries since the global recession. But I'm sure there's no connection between the two. Now let's break the set. Speculation has been replacing hard fact. Terrorists don't read Twitter. Who's right and who's wrong? It was a terrible thing to say, period. The mistake entirely on me. What we need is to question more and to keep it uncensored, real and raw. These words are hard hitting, you're watching your neck, but you need to tune in because we're what we're going to say. When it comes to the corporate media's coverage of stories south of the border, it seems like every news piece is reduced to a superficial debate over the immigration crisis. But what's almost never discussed is the rampant corruption that has infected local governments across Mexico, leading to the... <laughs> what's happening, folks? I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. So remember how after the global financial crisis, we were supposed to reform an out-of-control banking system that thrived on lining the pockets of the 1%? at the expense of the rest of us. Well, apparently the world's billionaires didn't get the memo. See, according to a report just released by Oxfam International, since the crisis, 
quote, ended in 2009. The number of billionaires has actually doubled. That's right. In 2009, there were 793 billionaires worldwide. As of March of this year, that number now stands at 1,645. So wealth inequality must be decreasing if so many more people are entering the rarefied space occupied by the Cokes and Soroses of the world. Mm, not so much. See, the report also found that billionaire wealth has only become more concentrated, increasing by a combined 100 underneath the surface of the investigation. That virtually the entire government of Iguala was directly responsible for the disappearance of these students. See, based on interviews with dozens of witnesses, investigators allege that after the students were attacked by the cops, they were handed over to members of one of Mexico's deadliest drug cartels, Los Guerros Unidos. And this is hardly a case of just a few rogue, compromised officers. In fact, all the evidence points directly to the former mayor of Iguala, Jose Abarca, and his wife, Maria Pineda, as being the masterminds behind this sick plot. Members of Guerros Unidos have now admitted that at least 30 Iguala police officers were working directly for the cartel under the leadership of Abarca and Pineda, and that they've acted as the couple's personal hitmen. And while 56 people have been arrested in connection to this potential mass murder, Abarca and Pineda have been missing for weeks and are now considered fugitives. Now, the motive for such a despicable act is still not entirely clear. But the most logical explanation is a brutal suppression and use of mass violence against civilian populations. Over the course of the last few months, we've seen every part of the stark reality played out in the southern Mexican city of Iguala. See, back in September, 43 students from a teacher's college went missing after they were viciously attacked by local police during a protest against discriminatory hiring practices, leaving six people dead. In the days and weeks following, at least 12 mass burial graves were discovered near the city, filled with the charred and dismembered remains of dozens of bodies, leading Iguala residents to fear the worst about the fate of these young students. However, according to Mexican officials, the DNA of these particular bodies did not match the students, highlighting just how prevalent mass murder really is in this part of the country. And just this week, yet another mass grave was uncovered about 10 miles from where the students were last seen, reigniting a nightmare scenario all over again. But as disturbing as these findings are, an even more insidious fact lurks beneath the student protests disrupted a campaign event that Panetta was holding on the same day to launch her own bid for mayor. Of course, throughout the course of these events, federal authorities have distanced themselves as far as possible from the Iguala government, all along feigning shock at what transpired there. But average Mexicans know better than to trust those in Mexico City have no idea what was going on in a town just 100 miles away. According to a senator from the Barca's own political party, quote, everyone knew about their presumed connections to organized crime. Nobody did anything, not the federal government, not the state government, not the party leadership. See, these disappearances are just the latest to hit Mexico during the war on drugs. In fact, according to the Mexican government's own figures, over the course of the last eight years, a stunning 20,000 people have gone missing. This, on top of the 60,000 people that have been killed in connection to the drug war just between the years 2006 and 2012. All the while, billions of dollars continue to be funneled into Mexico from the U.S. as part of the Merida 